Andrew Huberman's discussion, he touches on the essential and often neglected aspect of fitness routines, the element of personal preference. Now, in terms of exercise, exercise during the day increases the rates of lymphatic clearance at night. He suggests a general 60-40 split between weight training and conditioning, which could act as a useful starting point for our fitness enthusiasts. Pick three exercises, compound exercises, multi-joint uh, movements. Do them for, do three to five exercises. However, he quickly points out that this generic template has got to be customized according to your individual needs, your preferences and capabilities. If you dread full body splits, he recommends finding an alternative that you'll actually enjoy, like uh, a push-pull legs routine. When we do certain forms of exercise, there's a hormone-like molecule that's released into the blood bloodstream called osteocalcin. Osteocalcin um, is known to provide support to neurons in a brain area called the hippocampus, which is involved in learning and memory. Um, the 150 to 180 minutes of zone two cardio per week will support overall brain health and function by way of improving blood flow. Now the key is to stick with the routine consistently, which is easier if the regimen aligns with your preferences. Too often workout routines are presented as a one size fits all solution with little consideration to individual differences. Huberman's approach challenges the norm by placing personal preference at the center of the workout planning. Avoid cold immersion, so ice baths and being in cold water up to the neck, uncomfortably cold, within the four hours after a, a training session that's designed to evoke an adaptation, either endurance, hypertrophy, or strength, because the inflammation that you experience from a hard endurance workout or from a hard strength or a hard hypertrophy workout is the stimulus by that you're going to adapt to. Huberman delves into the significant but often overlooked concept of mind-muscle connection, elaborating its vital role in enhancing workout results, particularly in muscle hypertrophy. But what I find is every time I work out early in the day, I have more energy all day long, and I never know why that is. And it, it's because you start, to, most likely, it's because you liberate a bunch of dopamine and adrenaline from your system, so you get a long arc of, of activation and alertness, plus you are eliminating whatever adenosine is, is there, and so you feel like you have a lot of energy throughout the day. He emphasizes the importance of proper movement execution and intentional muscle contraction during workouts. This approach goes beyond just lift and weights. It's about consciously challenging muscles and focusing on the sensation of exertion. The cold water immersion reduces inflammation and can short circuit some of that. After four hours, you're probably okay, but if you can do it a different day or you can do it before those sessions, that's better. Heat, however, can be done immediately after training and it's probably beneficial because of the way that it dilates the vascular system and delivers, perfuses the muscles and ligaments, etc., with more nutrient. This mind-muscle connection is pivotal in predicting results, indicating a substantial mental aspect to physical training. It is not just about how much you can lift, bro. The more you train your mind to be in sync with your muscles during your workouts, the better your results are gonna be. But at a basic, in basic form, people doing push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, dips, um, you know, uh, jump squats, you know, basic load-bearing um, behaviors. It's actually well established that cognitive function in aging can be assessed indirectly by grip strength. Now, why would that be? You have lower motor neurons, which are neurons in your spinal cord that control contraction of the muscles that by releasing neurotransmitter onto those muscles, but you have upper motor neurons, which control deliberate motor action. And grip strength is something that really involves those upper motor neurons. And um, you actually can do this as a, as a test that if you're lifting weights, if you um, grip really strong, let's say you're even doing a unilateral movement, if you clinch the opposite fist really, really hard, you'll find that you can move more weight for more repetitions because you're engaging the entire upper motor neuron to lower motor neuron system. So there's a chain of neural events there. So the idea is that people should be doing three to four days a week minimum, but uh, when you say minimum, there isn't much more room for upper upper limit, but three to four days a week of some sort of load bearing exercise that could be weight training with machines or free weights, but it could also again be push-ups, pull-ups, dips, um, jump squats. The ability to jump and grip strength are highly correlated with cognitive function later in, a, in age. So why would that be? Again, it's these hormonal signals sent from the body to the brain. The implications of this are enormous, especially for those focusing on muscle growth. 
Additionally, consistency and regular practice further strengthen this connection. An intriguing aspect of Huberman's talk is his insights into the common inflammatory conditions that gym goers experience, often originating from incorrect grip techniques. By merely adjusting the grip to leverage more from the palm than the fingers, gym enthusiasts can significantly reduce discomfort and risk of injuries. Now that tip might seem minor, but its implications for safe and effective training are significant. Now in terms of training, he has this beautiful three by five concept for strength. Pick three exercises, compound exercises, multi-joint uh, movements. Do them for, do three to five exercises for three to five repetitions per set, rest three to five minutes, and do that three to five times per week. And for details, you can, again, look to the episode, it's time stamped. But what's interesting about this is three to five times a week is a lot for a muscle group. Squatting th five times a week for five reps, meaning you're working pretty heavy, meaning you're close to failure, but not failure for strength, generally. What Andy taught me is that people who are training mostly for strength can do these low rep type regimens frequently because most of the adaptation is neural. And because you're not pushing to failure in most cases, you don't get that sore. And so it's the motor neurons getting the muscle fibers to contract more intensely or with more efficiency in other ways that's leading to these strength gains. And this is why powerlifters can train every day or five days a week or four days a week. For hypertrophy, I learned from Andy that the repetition range can be pretty broad. You think anywhere from six to 30 repetitions, you should do 10 sets per muscle group per week, maybe even a bit more. Now, in terms of exercise, exercise during the day increases the rates of lymphatic clearance at night. So the reason I mention this is that these are indirect effects on lymphatic clearance and blood flow. Now, what about direct effects? The direct effects bring us to osteocalcin. And the direct effects of exercise on brain function and health actually come from stimulation of the skeleton and load-bearing exercise. And this is something that I think is underappreciated. When we do cardiovascular work, again, you support blood flow, lymphatic clearance, but osteocalcin is made by the bones. Wow, a hormone that's made by bones that's released into the bloodstream and then goes to the brain and improves brain function. And how does this work? Well, when the skeleton has load, load bearing, um, it is load bearing, then osteocalcin is released and it makes perfect sense. Why would the brain continue to support its own function if the body isn't being used? Well, let's say, how does the brain know that the body is being used? The body knows that, uh, the brain, excuse me, knows that the body is being used for load bearing work because osteocalcin is that signal. Again, the brain and body have to communicate. And it's not like the body says, oh, I weight trained today or I did um, calisthenics today. No, it doesn't work that way. There's a hormone signal to communicate that to the brain. So this can be achieved a number of different ways. I actually think body weight exercises can be quite good. Um, there are a couple of online sources that I, mean, I think the incredible work that Ido Portal is doing, I-D-O Portal, he's big on this movement, he calls it movement culture, but this is, he's a, in, he's a phenom, but you know, not just doing push-ups and, and burpees and not that sort of thing, which are very linear, but a lot of non uh, dynamic, non-linear movement. He talks about explosiveness, suppleness. So you have to learn how much you can work out, how long, how hard, so that you don't actually reduce your brain's ability to function. A lot of people think they have ADHD or brain fog. They're just training like a maniac early in the day. And then your body has, doesn't have different resources for brain and body. I wonder if that has a cumulative effect on IQ. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the gym uh, bros might not want to hear that. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because um, th there's this kind of, I feel comfortable talking about this, this sort of culture in academia where People are really, um, I know a lot of very smart people. I'm blessed to be surrounded by a lot, very, a lot of smart people in, in and inside and outside of academia. But generally, in, the academics I know are really into endurance sports. They run, they swim, they play tennis. You know, it's rare that somebody goes to the gym with a specific interest in building muscle. That's not typically associated with um, the academic phenotype, although there are a few. I have, I have some colleagues that um, one down at um, Baylor, He's an exceptional neuroscientist. He's really into, for instance, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I think times are, are, are changing now. I think people realize that 
unless, at least what the science shows, that unless people get about five or six sets of reasonably hard work of resistance exercise per muscle group, that they're going to be losing muscle over the course of their lifespan.